perhaps you can hear that toad singing right outside the Prado doors. It's always good to have a drink of water on hand. This mug, by the way, is Artemis, which was one of Lancaster's original founding cafes. Hi, and welcome back to my channel. Thank you for stopping by. I do appreciate it. Tonight, I want to talk to you about the short story Alamagusa. Alamagusa first appeared in Astounding Magazine in 1955, and it was written by Eric Frank Russell. Now, it also has the distinction that year of being the first short story to win the Hugo Award. So that's why I thought we would take a look at it tonight and maybe just talk about it in brief, because it's the first. Oh, hello there. And now for a word from our sponsor. Tonight's episode is brought to you by mayonnaise, now with 72% less plutonium. The story Alamagusa was also collected in various anthologies, the first of which was the Hugo winners in 1962. Boy, can you hear that frog out there? Holy shit, he's singing for all he's worth, that little son of a bitch. As far as short stories go, Alamagusa is very much a story of its time. It, I think, uh, has an intention to be a little tongue-in-cheek funny. That didn't land all that well for me, but you know, only because it's from a different time. I know that other uh, literary critics ha have said that it landed quite funny for them. You know, and er everybody's different, right? So the story of Alamagusa is pretty simply laid out. Uh, there's a uh, rocket ship that it that has come into port for. Uh, I guess the end of a tour, they, they're, uh, they've, they've pulled into port, so to speak, uh, on, at some other location. I don't want to go into too many details in the story because I would like you to be able to enjoy reading it. And because it's a short story, it would be quite easy to spoil, right? So the, uh, the, uh, the ship is called the Bustler. And the Bustler is in port, and the captain is Captain McNaught. And uh, I, you know, I was in the Air Force, and I mean, I think captain is the second or third rank you get, but captain in the Navy, which is kind of the basis for this military idea in the story, is a much higher rank and, and uh, you know, someone way more in the rarefied high-ranking officer you know, cadre. So anyway, uh, all of his crew are out on shore leave and having a good time. So he gets a notification for an inspection. Now that the bustler... Uh, crew has been notified that there's going to be an inspection. Uh, Captain McNaught is ruminating more or less over the fact that the guy who's coming to do the inspection is a real stickler. And uh, so it is explained in the story that, you know, when the captain first took over the bustler, the starship, he signed off on everything. They went through it, he signed off on everything. And so if something gets lost, broken, or stolen, that is entered into the records. And if it's not, when the stickler shows up to do his inspection and you haven't accounted for that, you're in big trouble. And as a matter of fact, it's explained as being a, like a career, not necessarily ending, but killing uh, certain aspects of your career and it's not really great. And uh, that, that, is a, that is a level of strictness that you know, is absolutely insane. So somebody made that, you know, Eric Frank Russell made that up for a, a, a future that you know, hopefully uh, you know, we, we never live in a future that's so technologically hamstrung and overwrought that there's really no wiggle room, right? This severe uh, kind of uh, technological no wiggle room, you know, you, you better have everything be a certain way. There's almost like a fascism of, uh, of you know, or corporatized kind of structure to the military where there's just no wiggle room uh, in the science for anything to be missing or anything to be out of place reminded me a lot of uh, the cold equations, which also had its own kind of mathematical uh, limits and its physical and engineering limits, which were just completely un unreasonable. And, uh, you know, you have to leave room for uh, failure and backups and redundancies and different things like that. So, uh, you know, it, it's a, I, I think it's kind of a uh, it's a conceit or an artifice or a vehicle for to to make the story work right with without these kind of things the story wouldn't turn and uh so in alamagusa one of the things that the story turns on is that there's just no wiggle room for this inspection so you better get that shit right so anybody who's in the military understands that my tone there was you know they probably were reminiscing for a minute about some asshole sergeant breathing down their fucking necks about something that they could give two shits about because it's Friday and they're really looking forward to going out and getting drunk. 
Remember those days? I was in northern Japan. It was a lot of fun. Without giving away too much of the story, the bustler, the crew of the bustler start going through all of their stuff. The captain is, starts at the stern. I guess they're going from the, the bow to the stern. In this case, he's going from stern to the bow. Uh, and, you know, why or why, that's, why or why that's not necessary, you know, is something that's explained in the story. And uh, they start looking through everything, and I guess everything is in its place that should be. And all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed, but there's something called an offog and nobody can figure out what the off fog is. So I left a bunch of other things out of the explanation uh, because I, you might actually guess if I start explaining too much without even telling you. No one knows what the off fog is and the captain goes on kind of a, uh, a little bit of a tizzy trying to figure all of this out and, and in the learning of what the off fog is and what the consequences are and what the final results are, we, we would have the conclusion of the story. Now, this story got a Hugo Award, okay? This is a story about a ship that comes into a port. They, they can't account for something. A, uh, an inspector is coming to see them, and hijinks ensue. And that got a Hugo. So if I could just give you a, a few of my general impressions about this story without um, spoiling it in any way. First, I'll have a, a little drink. This short story. Uh, seems to remind me a little bit of kind of the situational comedy that you would encounter in uh, Cary Grant films, the comedies of errors and uh, misunderstandings and different things like that. And kind of like, uh, you know, there's, a, there's kind of a romantic attitude to it. So there's a little bit of that in the, in the movie. But there's also some interesting things like, you know, if you watch some great old uh, military movies from the early days of World War II, before we, didn't, before we knew how the war was going to go. I mean, not that we ever really doubted it, right? But uh, we just had to fight the fight. But if you watch an old movie like, say, Air Force, or, you know, or The Road to Burma, different things like that, uh, not only are they spectacular films, but there's, there's the whole thing of the, uh, the enlisted and the uh, lower officer ranks kind of fighting against the man. You know, there's, uh, there, there's the power structure, and they're bossing you around and sending you to your death and or sending you out on missions and, and or you know, just giving you a really fucking hard time, which is part of what they do. So there, there's, there's just a little of that old, like, outsmart the man feeling in, in the story where they, you know, they, they've got this inspector coming who's a rear admiral, and, uh, and they've got this offog, which they can't account for, and it's going to be a career-crushing thing. And so then they have to kind of devise a, a uh, shenanigans ensue kind of, you know, solution to it. Uh, you know, the story has those aspects to it, and I really liked it. I, and, I, and I feel like the story also tried to be funny, and that didn't land for me, and it might land for you differently. And, um, you know, you, you spend a lot of years reading, you know, kind of the dark stuff that most of us read nowadays, and, you know, and, and America's been through a lot more since this story was written, and this was written in the 50s when America was living in perfect bliss, and, uh, you know, so the thing, things have changed, society has changed, you know, and it's very telling that the people chose this quaint, harmless, polite, fun story to be the official first winner of the Hugo Award, right? The choice of the people. And it says a lot about the time. So it's kind of neat that way. And so with that in mind, I really do recommend this story to you. And, uh, I hope you enjoy it. Okay, that's the video. Thanks for stopping by. Please like and subscribe. Have a good day, and I'll see you later.